You're an interesting story, man, because uh, not just because your personality, but because you're you've come back from mental illness and you're very, very open about it. Yeah. You know, I think that's it's a, that's a very unique thing. Right? I remember when you when you beat Klitschko and won the title and then you kind of went off the rails and I thought you were just partying. You know, when when yeah. I had heard about it, I thought, well, guy made a shitload of money, became the heavyweight champion, all the pressure and the press and all the craziness. But it was more than that. It was more than that. It, it started off like I'd suffered with mental health problems my whole life, but I didn't know what it was because I never had no education on the matter. Um, and it wasn't until after the Klitschko fight, a very massive high, then I had to have a even worse a low, lowest low that anyone could ever have. Um, I'd wake up and i think, why did I wake up this morning? This is coming from a man who had everything. Money, fame, glory, titles, a wife, a family, kids, everything. But I felt as if I had nothing. I felt there was an empty, gaping hole that was just filled with gloom and doom. And it just was one bad thing happened to me after another. Within seven days, the IBF stripped me of their title because I couldn't defend against Glasgow, who was a nobody, because I had a rematch clause with Vladimir. Oh, they strip you of the IBF belt. You go in a negotiation with Klitschko for the rematch. How yeah. come the rematch never happened? The rematch didn't happen initially because I went over on my ankle in training. Um, I was in Holland training for the rematch. And I was running up on heavy terrain. And I went over on my ankle, sprained my ankle quite badly. So we had to postpone the fight. And But by the time I was off, like, say, three months, getting his ankle right and all that... I just, I just didn't want to do it anymore, if you know what I mean. I didn't have the desire. The fire wasn't burning no longer to fight. And I was suffering with depression the whole time. Even in training camp, before I sprained my ankle, I was depressed as depressed could be on a daily basis. And I'm thinking, why am I feeling like this? I don't have no reason to feel like it. Some people will say, oh, well, it's attention-seeking or whatever. But unless you've experienced what I'm saying, it's sort of impossible to understand where I've been or where I've come from. And it just went from bad to worse. Um, I hit the drink heavily on a daily basis. I hit the drugs. Um, I was out all night partying with, with uh, women of the night and not coming home. And, you know, I didn't care about boxing. I didn't care about living. I just wanted to die. And I was going to have a good time doing it while I was doing it. I used to drink and take drugs to get away from the depression because when I was drunk or high, then I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't think about being depressed. I thought about being I'm a, a boxing champion or I'm a, I feel great. But as we know, when the drink wears off, it only leaves you with a bad hangover and feeling even more depressed. For someone who suffers with mental health, the worst thing we can do to escape it is take drugs or alcohol. But yeah, that's the most common approach. And that's the common approach because people, we don't know. Because yeah. it's not spoke about. And this is where I want to spread the word on mental health so when other people are in this position in the future, they know where to go and they know what to do. Because there's a blueprint you you were focused for that fight you were you were prepared and afterwards was it just the realization that you had accomplished this incredible goal that set into depression was it you didn't know what to do next or was it just that your focus was now no longer on this unattainable you know like a, in almost insurmountable obstacle in front of you becoming the heavyweight champion of the world all of a sudden you did it then the depression kicks in yeah, my conditioning trainer, Christian, he said to me before the Klitschko fight, he said, what will you do after you win? I said, probably be depressed for a long time. He said, what? I said, truthfully, I was almost expecting it. And I didn't think I'd ever box again. Even the day after the Klitschko fight, Sky Sports interviewed me, the, the UK broadcaster who put it on. And he said, what's next for Tyson Fury? I said, I'll probably never box again. I knew. Wow. I said to me dad and my brothers before the fight, a week before the fight, I said, win, lose or draw. I said, this is probably going to be my last fight because I knew the fire was going. I didn't have that hunger anymore. I had the hunger to beat Vladimir Klitschko, but not to carry on and continue. And I said, I didn't want it to be about money or, or financial gain. I wanted to be the best of my time, beat the best man. And that's what I did. And I was a man of my word and I didn't box again until... Two and a half year later, I decided to make a comeback because I was sitting here at 400 pounds, a drug addict, an alcoholic. By the way, I'd never took a drug in my life until I got to 27. Really? Never. Nothing. Nothing. Not smoked weed, not, not nothing. 
And what, drug what were free. the drugs? What were the drugs of choice once you won the title? Cocaine was the usual one. And that was it, really. Cocaine and alcohol. It's like... Roller coaster. Crazy drug, drug and alcohol mix. Mm, yeah. But, you know, I look back on it now, and I think, would I change that? I wouldn't. I'm not many people will think, well, this man's crazy for saying that on a radio show, but I wouldn't change a thing because I know it was supposed to happen and I needed to be tested to see what type of character I was. Although I did all those mad things and I went for a wall that time and I tried to commit suicide. and How did you, you try to commit suicide? Well, I'll tell you what happened. I, Like I said, I was waking up and I didn't want to be alive. I was making everybody's life a misery. Everybody who was close to me was pushing away. Nobody could talk to me, talk any sense into me at all. And I'd go very, very, very low at times, very low. And I'd start thinking all these crazy thoughts and this, that and the other. And I was in my car, I bought a, I bought a brand new Ferrari convertible um, in the summer of 2016. And I was in it and I was on the highway. And there's a strip of the highway where I am. And at the bottom of about a five mile strip, there's a massive bridge that crosses the motorway. And I knew that. And I got the car up to 190 miles an hour. I was heading towards that bridge. And I didn't care what no one was thinking. I didn't care about hurting my family, me, my career, people who friends, anybody. I didn't care. I didn't care about nothing. I just wanted to die so bad. I give up on life. And just as I was heading towards that bridge at 190 in this Ferrari, it had crushed like a Coke can, by the way, if I'd have hit it. I heard a voice say, no, don't do this, Tyson. Think about your kids. Think about your family and your little boys and girls growing up with no father. And everyone saying your dad was a weak man. He left you. He took the easy way out because he couldn't do anything about it. And I, before I turned into the bridge, I, I pulled on the motor and I was shaking. I could feel myself shaking and I pulled over and I was all nervous and I didn't know what to do. And I was frightened and I was so afraid. And I thought that day, I'll never, ever, ever try or think about taking my own life ever again. And I didn't. I went and got help from a, the leading psychiatrist um, doctor in the UK. And my dad went up with me and she said to me, dad, she said, can I have a word alone with you, John? He said, yeah. My dad told me what she said when he came out. She said, he is not to be trusted alone. He's an imminent death risk. That's the highest level of suicide risk that she'd ever assisted. And she said, without his faith, he would have been dead a long time ago. But she said, faith alone ain't going to hold him because that's going to break. And once that goes, he's done. So that put my dad's life terror as well because... He was checking up on me all the time. He wanted to be with me 24-7. He was even sleeping in my house with me. A married man with four kids. I was in a right state. I just... I just... I, I, wanted, I just didn't want to live anymore. And I had everything that a man could want. There wasn't nothing I didn't have. But it meant nothing. Nothing meant anything. I felt worthless. And the longer it went on, the, the, the more it, it hurt inside, the more I was hurting everybody. Everybody gave up on me. My full family thought I was definitely going to die and I was going to kill myself. And after that, I, I tried, I was thinking to myself, you know what, I need to get better, I need, I need to do something. But every time I tried to go to the gym, I had another voice saying, nah, this ain't for us anymore, I'm not going to do this. I didn't want to do it, I'd run, I'd run 200 yards and pull up. And I was out drinking. I didn't care, give up. Taking drugs, like I said. And it come to a point, I was doing that for 18 months of my life. And I was out 2017 Halloween. I was a 400 pounds dressed up as a skeleton. And I go to this fancy dress party and I'm looking around and I'm thinking, these are all young kids compared to me. I'm 30 and I feel like I was the oldest guy in there, like 29. I was like, what am I doing here? Is this what you want for your life? And I thought to myself, this is not me. And no matter how many people told me before this, where I was going wrong, what I was doing, you need to act to your life. You can only change your life if you want to change it. And I, I left, and everyone said, are you going home early? I said, yeah. I left at nine o'clock, I went home. And I got back home, I didn't say anything to the wife, I went straight upstairs into a dark room. And I took the stupid skeleton suit off, and I was, I was sat there, and I got on my knees, and I was praying and begging God to help me. And at this point, I'd never, I'd never begged or cried to God to help me before. I prayed a lot. 
all my life, but I'd never been in this physical state before. I could feel tears running down my face. My chest was wet with tears. Because I knew I couldn't do it on my own. It wasn't possible for me. Because I tried and tried and tried and I ended up back in the pub, back drinking. I almost accepted that that was going to be my fate, an alcoholic. So I was on my knees in this bedroom and after praying for about 10 minutes, I got up and I felt the weight of the world was lifted off my shoulders. And for the first time in years, I knew I was going to make a comeback. And I called my wife. I said, Paris, Paris. She said, what? She thought I was drunk coming home from the pub. I said, Monday morning, I start to regain mission to try and get the heavyweight championship of the world back. She said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because before this, every time I'd have a beer, I'd come back and I'm going to be the heavyweight champion of the world again. Because it was, it was the alcohol talking. 